Over the last year, I have taken 300 calls with e-commerce brand owners. And here's the truth. Less than 30% of them focus or pay any attention to email marketing. And an even smaller amount actually does email marketing correctly. So let's talk about it. Is email marketing dead? Absolutely not. But one thing that I continuously see is that e-commerce brand owners do their email marketing wrong. And in specifically, they structure their emails incorrectly. So in this video, I'm going to be giving you the perfect email formula. I'm going to be showing you how you can ethically steal some of the best practices from seven and eight figure brands. And then I'm also going to be giving you a tool so that way you can structure out your perfect email. So that way you can start plugging and playing this immediately. I want this video to be massively, massively valuable. So let's go ahead and jump straight into it. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Jonathan Zamora. I'm the founder and owner of Settler Systems, an e-commerce accelerator that helps e-commerce brands hit their first million dollars in 12 months or less. We've had over 150 customers and have generated over over $50 million for our clients. Let's jump straight in. So often e-commerce brand owners will ask me, why is my email marketing ineffective? And honestly, it could be a ton of reasons. And that's why I'm going to be providing this perfect email structure tool. So that way you can structure out your emails properly, because more often than not, it's going to be the structure of how you are presenting information that is actually holding you back. But first, here's how you can ethically steal some of the best strategies from seven and eight figure brands. I'm going to be providing you two quick tools. So that way you could get some copy and design inspiration. So the first tool is called reallygoodemails.com. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a bunch of really good emails. One of the things that I really like about this tool is the variety of emails that you will see. You'll see things that are software related like Klaviyo emails, but then you'll also get things that are even outside of e-commerce like Zillow emails. There's a wide, wide range of emails that they're going to be providing and they make it super easy for you to be able to save these emails and refer back to them. You could also use their search function at the very top so that that way you could go through and narrow down your results and make it super easy to find what you're looking for. The second option here is one that I absolutely love. It's called milled.com. You're going to see a bunch of e-commerce direct to consumer brands. And in my opinion, milled is a little bit better than really good emails. Even though the design isn't as nice, they update their emails every single day. So you have a never ending flow of inspiration. So that way you can look at what some of the biggest brands on the face of the planet are doing in literally a blink of an eye. Whatever you are going through and writing the copy or doing the design for your emails, use either really good emails or milled.com to get some of that inspiration. Remember, nothing is completely original. So even with these brands, they used inspiration whenever they were creating their emails. So use this as inspiration. Obviously, don't carbon copy it, but start to get a little bit of a taste of what these people are doing and why and start to work that into your brand's emails and marketing as a whole. Before I go through and provide you the sheet for the perfect email formula, I want to make sure I walk you through step by step how exactly to use the sheet because the understanding is just as important as the tool. Okay, whenever we are going through and structuring our emails using the perfect email formula, the very first step in the formula is answering three questions. The first question is why should I open this email? What is the thing that is going to drive my curiosity and get me interested enough to actually click on it in the first place? Remember here, we are not selling the product. We are not trying to get them to read the rest of the email. We just want to drive in tree, peak curiosity. So that way our email stands out from the thousands and thousands of other emails that are in their inbox. My inbox literally has like 40,000 emails in it. So that is question number one. Question number two is going to be, why should I read this email? What is going to be the thing that is going to hook me and get me interested to actually spend 20, 30 seconds of my day to read whatever you have to say? And then the third question is, is why should I go to the website? Why should I click? With each of these individual items, what you're going to do is you're going to answer them. You're going to put them into the perfect email formula and answer these questions. If you don't know why somebody should click, if you don't know why they should read, why they should uh, even open up the email in the first place, then they're not going to know. So the very first step of this is driving clarity for yourself. Okay. So for your answer on why they should open up this email, that is going to become your subject line. This is going to be the thing that they see inside of their inbox. This has to pique curiosity. So the very first step of really creating a good subject line is rewriting it a few times. Now, now, one of the things that I like to do, especially for this perfect email formula, this is the sheet you're going to be using. I like to rewrite them with driving curiosity and teasing them a little bit on what's going to be inside multiple different ways. And this could be done through capitalization. This could be done through emojis. This could be done in a variety of ways. So let me go ahead and write just a couple of quick examples. So here's just a couple of very quick examples for you to showcase how this could be used. So this could be discussing the same exact thing, but what we are saying inside of the subject line can vary quite a bit. And we could 
pull out certain elements. So this first one is, this is what million dollar brands do differently. The thing that's special about this subject line is the capitalization of the word this. It makes it seem like there is a very specific thing that they are doing differently. And you'll actually see this present a lot in my YouTube videos whenever I am making the titles. The next one is the 10X formula that doubled the Jason's investment. Doesn't that pique your curiosity? Doesn't it drive some interest and start to kind of tease you on what's going to be inside? You want to know what that investment is. What's that formula? How did Jason do it? Is Jason like me? Does he have similar interests? Does he have a similar amount of money to invest? These are the types of things that we're going to rewrite three or four different times. Now you could go through and split test one or two of these, or you could just choose the one that's your favorite. But keep in mind, whenever you're writing this, we're just driving curiosity, peaking interest, pay attention to your capitalization and emojis. You'll be all good to go. You'll write a beautiful subject line. Now for the third step for why they should read this email, this is now going to become the body text of what is going to be included inside of the email. Now there is some very specific elements that you should be including inside of any good email. And we're going to pull out every single one of those elements here. So the very first one is going to be rewrite to shorten and make sure that each sentence and word is necessary. More often than not, whenever I am going through and writing, why should they open this? I'll go through and write a couple of paragraphs, just jot down my ideas. And if you're not there and you're having a hard time with this, just allow yourself to fail. Allow yourself to not have a good body text at this point. And just get all of your thoughts down on why somebody, somebody should be clicking on this in the first place. Once you have that, you're going to rewrite it, but shorten it. Take out any of those things that don't really apply. If you're getting too in the weeds on any of the details, pull that out and really just drive home the specific reason why they should read it. Now, one of my favorite exercises is to go through and add in some daily frustrations, their desire transformation and credibility. The more clearly that you can describe somebody's problems, the more likely they are to believe that you have the solution. So if I told you, oh, hey, you have you have knee pain. Uh, well, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. Here's this knee brace. Well, that might not really be, you know, super interesting to you. But if I said, hey, I know you have knee pain because you are powerlifting for the last 10 years. And the thing that naturally happens with powerlifters is the pain on the outside of their knee starts to increase over time because they're pushing out when they're squatting and doing deadlifts. Now that that's so specific, if that is the situation that I am dealing with, I'm going to probably buy this product or at least believe that this solution is for me because of the depth of knowledge that the writer has about my specific problem. Whenever I am writing a copy, I like to really think about the frustrations, the transformation, what exactly are they wanting to get from this? And then building in some credibility. Have we had any testimonials or reviews of people that start to state what that transformation is or the desired result that we are hoping our audience is going to get? Has anybody said that inside of a testimonial that we could show that people have had that transformation from our product? This is the place to kind of work that in. Now, as far as where it needs to go, it could kind of be massaged all the way throughout. It doesn't have to be in any specific place. The important thing is that you have it. The third aspect of this is going to be stylizing your writing. So you're going to start by taking some words that are maybe a little bit boring, a little bit mundane and making them interesting. So if you said start losing weight by going to the gym, that's fine. But here's something that we could do that would make it a little bit more interesting. Dissolve 30 pounds of fat without having to spend hours in the gym. So then it kind of highlights some of the specific problems. They don't want to spend a bunch of time in the gym. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes energy. But then also by using the word dissolve it makes it seem a little bit more effortless. We're not saying that it's going to be, you know, a, a ton of work. We're saying it's it's going to be dissolved. It's just going to disappear. And so these are the stylistic choices that you have to make whenever you're writing your copy. And I like to do these in layers. So that way I can focus on adding these things while I'm doing that specific section of the email. The very last layer of rewriting that you're going to do is adding in momentum phrases. This is probably one of the most important things. And it's something I don't see people talk about. And I have no idea why, because they are so incredibly powerful. What is a momentum phrase? A momentum phrase is a specific phrase that you're going to use to make it so that your reader slowly just gets dragged through all of your copy and they feel like they have to read the next sentence and then the next sentence and then the next sentence. The same way that we're breaking up our email into why should they open? Why should they read? Why should they click? You should be doing this with your copy whenever you're writing it. Whenever you write your, your first sentence, you should build in why should they read to the second sentence. And whenever you write the second sentence, you should build in why they should read to the third sentence. And so this is what momentum phrases are going to do for you. Here is a few examples of momentum phrases that work incredibly well. Here's why. Let me explain. 
The secret is this. This is why X matters. If I told you this is what million dollar brands do differently, and it's something that I have literally never seen anybody else do. That's the first sentence. Okay, cool. I teased a little bit on what is going on there. Now, how can I start to drive a little bit more curiosity? Let me explain. And then I go and tell you something that is relevant to that specific thing. Let me explain. This is the 10X formula that caused Jason to 10X his investment over the next 30 days. And then you could follow that up with here's why. And then, you know, continue. So it builds builds in this momentum so that as they are reading farther and farther along, it's starting to carry them through the entire email. That is going to be step number two. Now, the thing that you listed is why should they click on this email? That's now going to become your call to action. Now, a call to action is going to be a obviously saying the call to action and saying, you know, click here, buy now, X, Y, Z, whatever. But even more importantly, that's going to be the offer itself. So this is the way that you are phrasing what you are going to be giving them. And this is massively important. I see so many e-commerce store owners get this completely wrong. So let's go ahead and dive into the specific aspects of this. Number one is going to be what is the core offer? Is it a BOGO? Buy one, get one free. Is it 50% off? Is it $10 off? Having this core offer is going to be the thing that allows the offer to have legs on its own. If the only thing they caught was that it is $10 off, then great. You can add in these other elements to support that $10 off, but you have to have that one specific thing that's really going to stand out. Now, number two is going to be, is there scarcity? Now, scarcity is something that I think is pretty often misunderstood. And it's basically just showing that there isn't an unlimited amount of the specific product. So you could just say that there's only 100 available. There's only 50 available. There's only 25 available. There's a really good example of this where this uh, kid in like 2004, 2005, he went through and created a website. I think it's called like a million pixels. And he basically had a uh, homepage that basically only had a million pixels and he sold each pixel for a dollar. And what started to happen over time is this gained a ton of momentum, a ton of news coverage. And what happened over time was that really big people and teams and uh, sports teams and uh, new newscasts and things like that were going through and buying their own pixel. This has been studied a ton of times over and over again. And the reason that this kid was able to sell a million pixels, even though it had no inherent value, keep in mind, crypto and NFTs weren't a thing even at this point, uh, it had no real inherent value uh, was because there was scarcity. People wanted to have a piece of the pie and they knew there was only going to be a million left. And so as the story got bigger, the scarcity got larger. So this is something that becomes important important for you. Whenever you are listing your scarcity, A, make it so that it's real. If you're saying 25, actually only limit it to 25. And the reason is, is because we want people to feel left out. And then B, whenever you're listing your scarcity, you should make it something that's relatively realistic for yourself that you're pretty confident that you can sell out on. Because then what you get to follow up with is, hey, we sold out. And that just becomes social proof that everybody goes through and loves your brand. And if they don't join the next sell, they're going to be missing out. Scarcity is just limiting the amount, only 100 available. Next is going to be urgency. How long is this going to last? One of the biggest changes that I just recently helped one of my friends with that owns a brick and mortar is he has a gym that basically just allows people to come in for free. And while that is awesome and you could have friends come in for free, there's no specific pressure or time frame that they need to be doing it. And whenever humans get left up to their own sort of decision making, more often than not, people just don't make a decision. And that ends up being their decision. They'll figure it out at some point in the future. And so the shift that we made for him was making it so that only Friday was the day that he could have people come in for free. So they had free friend Friday. And what this forces people to do is to now come in at a specific time. So if they've been wanting to take their friend to that gym, then they know that the only way that they're going to get that person in for free is if they bring them on Friday. So if it's Thursday, you're going to schedule it for Friday because you don't want to have to wait another week. Where if it's Thursday and you could do it on any day, it might come Friday, it might come Saturday, might come Sunday, but then what ends up happening is you're not going to get around. This is why urgency matters is because it gives it a place in a time that they have to do it within and it calls people to actually go through and take action much faster. The following step here is going to be giving the promo a name. Let me explain. Whenever you are creating a promotion, one of the best things that you could do is give a reason why. A reason why is something that is going to tell your audience why you are running the promotion. If you just say, hey, it's 50% off, people are going to be a little bit skeptical about that. Okay, well, why are you giving the 50% off? Is this like just like kind of BS? Are you guys just sending this out to everybody constantly and running this 50% over and over again? Or is there a specific reason why you're wanting to do this? This could be like, hey, we're needing to clear out our inventory. We way over ordered. We 
we uh, are, um, you know, we're getting our new winter items in. So, you know, our winter items are only limited stock. Uh, this could be because it's Christmas. It could be because it's my wife's birthday. It could be because it's uh, Tuesday. You know, like it, it, you just have to give a reason why. And naming the promotion with a reason why makes it so that people have more faith in the promotion that you're actually putting out. Okay, and then the last step here is going to be massaging in that offer and the call to action into the email at least once, if not twice. Best practice is going to be working it in twice, once about in the middle, and then once at the end. But whenever you are going through and creating this offer, you want to make sure that you're including all of the elements of urgency, scarcity, listing out what that core offer is, making it super apparent. And then whenever you are doing the call to action, you just have to tell people the specific action that you are wanting them to take. You could say something as simple as click on the website and place your order so that way you don't miss out on this amazing offer. Saying the specific thing of clicking on the website and actually placing the order is just going to call people to then start to think, okay, should I be taking this action? And more often than not, this is a automatic behavioral pattern. Somebody hears something and they go through and do it. So if you have a specific call to action and you tell them what exactly they should be doing, you're going to get a much stronger result. Now, if you want a copy of the perfect email formula spreadsheet that I was using inside of the video here, go ahead and check out the description. I'll have a link so that way you guys could get your your very own copy. That's going to be it for this video, guys. I hope that this helps out your email marketing so that way you can scale up in 2022. If you enjoy this type of content, smash the thumbs up button and hit that red subscribe button. Join the freaking family. That's going to be it for this one. I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.